This is an NYY Sports Talk podcast presented to you by Baseballism, a premium lifestyle apparel brand inspired by America's pastime. Baseballism is America's brand. Now batting for the New York Yankees, the shortstop, number two. Welcome back. This is episode 125 of the NYYST podcast presented to you by Baseballism.com. I am your host, Christian, as always, joined by my co-host, Chris. You. And it's Stack Guy Rye. What up? Special bonus episode this week, which will be dropping for you Tuesday morning as uh, we have a very special interview coming up here with one of the co-authors of Inside the Empire, the great Bob Clappish. As I've told uh, the story in the interview, I used to very much look forward to reading his column when it appeared in the Bergen Record every Sunday morning. So it was a very uh, big honor for me talking to somebody that I actually look forward to reading. So Great interview, great insight. And he even elaborated beyond what you know was just told in the book, so... Definitely, uh, definitely check that out when that comes out. The book's already out because you see it's no, 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 no. The interview, okay. our interview, okay, which will play in like a minute. Okay. Our interview is not going to. Oh, gotcha. Do you understand what's happening? I right understand now? the gravity of your illness. Yes. No. Do you understand the gravity of your illness? I understand the gravity of my own illness. Okay. Yes. He doesn't understand it, folks. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh-huh. So, Bob Clappish uh, joined us for about a half hour here to talk about uh, Inside the Empire. There's a few very interesting stories in the book, which he will elaborate on how John Carl Stanton got here, how Joe Girardi t- is no longer here. So, uh, to kind of put a cap on A little on bit the, behind Judge as well, well. Yeah, you know. And to uh, put a time reference on this, we recorded this Sunday evening after the Yankees victory you'll hear this Tuesday so when you hear things referenced in the interview just know that this was recorded Sunday because we'll get the obligatory oh well you guys said that they were two and five in their last seven games but they played eight games since then because you know that's coming oh yeah it already came oh it did it's already here it's like future future Mm -hmm. they're just ready they know they know it's like out there in the universe they know okay okay Uh Okay, cool. so you're going to watch me watch this interview uh, now, okay? Watch me interview myself, okay? Chris and Christian of the NYYST podcast on the phone with uh, Bob Clappish, of, uh, one of the co-authors of Inside the Empire, the true power behind the New York Yankees. You can follow Bob on Twitter, at Bob Clapp. Bob, how you doing this evening? I am doing great. Thank you very much for having me on. Bob, I got to say, doing this podcast, we've got to talk to a lot of really cool people, some former major leaguers, people in the media. But for me, uh, as a baseball fan, I just got to get this out of the way real quick. It was actually one of the highlights of my Sunday to be able to read your column in the Bergen Record every Sunday morning. It was a, a tradition in my house where my father would leave the newspaper on the table, and that's how I knew that he was done with it and I could get to read it because I always look forward to read in your column on Sunday. And I'm not just saying that because you're on our show, but that's no, he, actually, said it, he said it to me this weekend. It's so actually he's not just blowing smoke. It's actually true. And I being a teenager, you know, all those years ago, you know, reading your column for all those years, I used to wake up at 10 o'clock on a Sunday. And if the paper wasn't on a table, I'd actually get mad. And that's how my day would start with a fight with my father. Why are you not done with the newspaper yet? But I just wanted to share that story. So it's actually pretty cool talking to you here. Uh, A little bit about the current Yankees and about how your book Inside the Empire came about. Uh, Before we get into the book, let's talk a little bit about the 2019 edition of the New York Yankees. The Yankees did pull off the win today in excruciating fashion, blowing two leads, finally winning in the 10th. Uh, after coming off a 32 and 10 stretch, they're now uh, two and five in their last seven. Is this recent stretch of games here something that uh, the fans should be worried about, it, or is this part of more like the normal ebbs and flows of a 162 game schedule? 
Well, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, they were on an incredible hot streak, and you know, having won nine ster- nine series in a row, they were due for a regression. And I think that's exactly what we saw this week on the road. I don't think there's any great issue to be uh, to be worried about. I don't think my evaluation of the team has changed much. I do obviously worry about the injuries more than anything else, but I, I, I think the, cap- the Yankees are capable of playing 600 ball. It's within their grasp, but pitching has become a problem. The health of the pitching staff is something obviously that they have, they have to address at some point. But do I think that the Yankees were overachieving? You know, uh, to any great extent, extent was it an illusion during that nine series win streak? I don't think so. I, I really think this is a special Yankee team. And barring any, you know, dra- dramatic turnaround, I do think that's going to they're going to be a factor deep into October. Bob, you mentioned you mentioned the injury bug, and I know hindsight's twenty twenty. But did the Yankees make a mistake not doing more to sign Keuchel? Uh, I I don't understand why Keuchel turned down you know a couple of extra bucks, uh, which is basically what it came down to between the Yankees and uh, and the Braves. I mean that. I, I think Keiko would have been a perfect fit. Um, you know, he's a proven a proven pitcher, uh, and I think the Yankees would have given him a much greater opportunity to get to the postseason, where he could have improved his free agent value uh, come the off season. So I I don't understand it. The Yankees probably could have made a stretch, a little bit of a stretch. But look, hey, maybe the guy just didn't really want to pitch in New York, and that's something you have to consider. Um, we don't really know what happened behind the scenes yet. I mean, I'm going to get to the bottom of that. But I am surprised he's not a Yankee, and the, and the blame may reside probably to some degree on both parties. With with Dallas Keuchel off the market now, where do you see this team turning uh, before the trade deadline here? Because they're obviously going to need to to add someone to this rotation. Well, I mean, but Madison Bumgarner is is the obvious choice, but the fact that the Yankees are so banged up right now and their need for pitchers so great and so obvious. You know, it's possible that Brian Cashman just won't bend. I mean, the, the, the price is going to be jacked up all around baseball. You know, to see if, if they can, other general managers are going to try their best to leverage the Yankees, given their obvious and critical need for another arm. I don't know if Cash will, will, will cave into that. I mean, he may just do his best to ride this out and, and wait for uh, Severino to come back, Jordan Montgomery to come back. See, they have to find out just how severe um, Herman's hip problem is. You know, I, I just have, there's one thing I learned about Brian uh, in writing this book, and there's several things I've learned about this front office that I had no idea about as a newspaper man, and just how tough he is, and he does not cave the pressure, he doesn't panic, and if he feels that, you know, the, the deal for, for Bumgarner is going to be too expensive, I don't think he'll make it. That's the obvious guy to me, for me right now. But again, you know, there are a couple other factors, that, a couple of the questions that still have to be answered before I would say that he's going to be a Yankee. Well, Chris and Christian here, the NYY Sports Talk podcast. We're talking to Bob Klappish, uh, co-author of Inside the Empire. Uh, let's get into the book a little bit here, Bob. Uh, sometimes to me, some greater than the stories in the book or the stories about how the book came about. Uh, run us uh, through how you guys came up with the idea to to write the book Inside the Empire. Well, I had been friends for a number of years with uh, Paul Saltaroff, who was a who was a Pulitzer nominee for Rolling Stone magazine. You know, he is a big Yankee fan, and we would have go out to lunch, you know, a couple times a year and talk about wouldn't it be cool to blend our styles and our experience and our our knowledge of baseball and to write this this real book about the Yankees. A newspaper man t- teaming up with a magazine writer and to come up with this very unique perspective on how an organization is run, and we said someday. And maybe that someday would be the 2019 Yankees because we saw how the young players were on the way up. This was back in 2016. We had planned sort of tentatively to do a book about this year's team. But then, you know, the Yankees almost get to the World Series in 2017. They come within a game of beating the Astros. And then in January of 2018, uh, December, I believe it was December or January, anyway, right in the off, middle of the offseason, they acquire Giancarlo Stanton. And suddenly the expectations go through the roof. Uh, the Yankees sold a half million tickets in January of 2018. And that's before the first pitch of spring training had even been thrown. So Paul and I looked at each other and said, you know what, you know what? if we wait until 2019, we're going to be a year too late. So we decided to launch the book about the 2018 Yankees and as the backdrop, sort of the foundation of the book. That would be the, the scaffolding. But it was really a look about how Brian Cashman 
has managed this organization, how he has run it, and how he survived for 20 years, never had a losing season, somehow didn't get fired by George Steinbrenner, and has overseen the complete overhaul of the business model here. I mean, Brian was a completely different GM in the first 10 years of his tenure, which is most, most of it consisted of, of handling George Steinbrenner. And then after George's passing, he has been an entirely different GM. And I think this is the real Brian Cashman that we have seen in the last decade. So to answer your original question, I went to Brian in January of 2018. I said, you know what? Your story has never really been told. I mean, you have been overshadowed by Joe Torrey, by Alex Rodriguez, by Derek Cheater, uh, by George Steinbrenner. Everyone here has had their story told, and you have not. You, ha- you are the genius behind this, and nobody knows that. And Brian hemmed and hawed a little bit. He's actually a very, very modest guy. And he said, look, if I say yes, if I give you access, you have to promise me that all the people around me get the credit that they're, that they're owed, that they're due. Like Gene Afterman, the assistant GM, Gene Michael, uh, Brian Savian. And he says, all these people have to be acknowledged in the book for me to say yes. And I said, of course. And he finally said, yes, I will sit down with you for hours at a time. And it turns out there were three or four long, long interviews with Brian throughout the season that made this book possible. Without Brian Cashman's approval and access to, to his to, to his mind, to his brain, there would have been no book. Fortunately, it all came together. Well, one of the uh, great stories in the book is kind of how the uh, Giancarlo Stanton trade did come about. Um, I think he's a very polarizing figure amongst Yankee fans. Some fans uh, are actually hoping he doesn't return this year. They have this belief that the Yankees are better without him. Uh, I, on the other hand, can't wait for him to come back because, I mean, he's a former MVP. I mean, you can only get better by adding that caliber of player to your club. But if the Yankees, we all know the Yankees had a pursuit of Shohei Otani and he ultimately chose to go to the Anaheim Angels. If Brian Cashman could have pulled that off in signing Otani, would this Stanton trade still have happened? Oh, definitely not. I mean, Stanton was a backup plan. Um, and there had, there had been, it had been originally broached between Stanton, I'm sorry, between Cashman and the Marlins and Mike Hill way back in like October. And Cashman very casually said, hey, you know, we've got some interest in your players. A couple of your players like Stanton, you know, let's let's keep the door open. You know, let's keep the lines of communications open and see what happens. And as you said, after Otani took the Yankees off the table, they were off the board. Cashman circled back with the Marlins and said, hey, maybe we can start talking about this. You know, what would it take? And that began a, a, a series of events that played right into Cashman's hands. And it really goes to Derek's Jeter, ha- Derek Jeter's handling of Stanton, or I should say his mishandling of Stanton from, from the get-go. And it really does speak to Jeter's own legacy as, as a player and as an executive, which are two completely different roles in life. And I'm not sure Derek has accepted or understood how much different he has to behave now. Um, I think Derek made a, a series of mistakes, which ended up the which ended up have, allowing the Yankees to basically steal Stanton. One, he never. I'm talking about Jeter now. He never called to congratulate Stanton when he won the National League MVP award in 2017. Just never called. Number two, he issued Stanton an ultimatum saying, if you want, you want to get traded, we're going to, if you tell, you take the trade we, we, we have gotten for you, the trade we have constructed for you to either the Cardinals or, or I'm sorry, let me back up. What he should have done, number, point number two is he should have said to Stanton, look, I can't afford to pay you. The Marlins cannot afford to pay you. We need to break this down, start all over, and we've got to move your salary. Where do you want to go? Now, a player of Stanton's stature has earned that right, has earned that courtesy to pick his next destination, or at least have the organization say, we're going to do our best to make you happy. Jeter never did that. He never gave Stanton the courtesy of that conversation, that phone call. Instead, he goes out and he makes a deal, tentative deals with the Cardinals and the Giants, and he tells Stanton, you better take one of these two deals or else we're going to keep you here. We're going to trade everybody around you, and you're going to be stuck here for 10 years. That's not the way you deal with a player of Stanton's stature. You just don't do that to him. And Stanton basically said, you know, F you. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to take that trade. And he forced, the, he forced, he basically boxed Jeter into a corner. And this is when Cashman came in, 
swooped in, and he realized that the only teams that that the Marlins could aff- could afford to trade Jeter to, I'm sorry, could afford to trade Standard to, was either the Dodgers who didn't want to pay, or the Yankees. The Yankees were the only place that Jeter could do business with in terms of Stanton. And it turns out that the Yankees picked up the National League MVP for a couple of prospects who may or may not ever make it. And in return, on top of that, he got the Marlins to pay $30 million of Stanton's uh, salary. So I thought the Yankees came off like they, they, they basically stole Stanton. It was the heist of the century. And it all goes to show you that because – Cashman is a better businessman than Jeter. I know it's a long answer, but that's what it comes down to, is that Jeter, Cashman was just smarter than Derek, and he just doesn't have the same ego as Derek. Bob, I think a very underrated facet of the Stanton trade is uh, they were they had to uh, ship out Starlin Castro to make the salaries work, and that kind of opened the door for uh, Glaber Torres. So if that trade doesn't go down, then maybe we don't see Glaber Torres uh, make his Major League debut last year. That's true. That's a very good point, and which never gets discussed quite enough. I mean, the Yankees love Sterling Castro at the beginning. Um, he's got some talent. He's got some pop in his bat, but it's just not enough consistency. You know, he just hasn't reached you know his upside in the way that most talent evaluators had had drawn up. There's there's more there, but he hasn't produced that yet. And the Yankees took a shot at him. Not a bad player at all, and you know had had the deal not happen sure the Yankees would have stuck with him a little longer but you're right Torres Torres there was so much buzz about him and the Yankees had been had looked at him and wanted him for quite some time and it just felt they felt that there was just a, a greater upside uh and you're right without that stand trade it never happens Bob it's funny because we're talking about a guy who in Derek Jeter who when he was here he could do no wrong and he was really I mean he was every Yankee fan's favorite player and then these stories start to come out, and and you you see a different side to him. A guy that reminds me of that right now with the fan base is Aaron Judge, um, a guy who came here, and the Yankees are usually a little more reserved when they start to, you know, base the franchise on one guy. But he really became not only the face of the Yankees, but a big face for baseball as well. When when did the Yankees, if you know, when did the Yankees kind of flick that switch and say, "This is the guy that we're gonna that we're gonna put people in the seats with. We're gonna build a judges' chambers instead of just saying, "Look, this wasn't really the full scouting report on this guy. Maybe we should wait a couple years." What was different with Aaron Judge? Well, you know, he almost didn't make the team. You know, out of spring training in in 2017, and again in 2018. I mean, his strikeout ratio was just. Horrific. I mean, there were there were people in the organization who thought, you know, he's just too big to play baseball. You know, he should have pursued basketball or football. I mean, his swing is too long, and there's just too many moving parts, and you know, he just strikes out too much, and he's never going to be, you know, the dominant player that that you know somebody maybe three inches shorter. I mean, for whatever reason, there there were talented evaluators who just were not sold on him, and then something clicked for Judge, you know, before the 2018 season. Um, and I think it, it was it was sort of an, or, an organic explosion. It happened on its own. The Yankees certainly didn't push it, um, but there's something there's a quality about Judge. First of all, I mean, he started hitting home runs like crazy, so he drew a lot of attention. He really upped his game, and you know, as I just said, there's a quality about Aaron that inspires others to play well. I mean, he's very young. I mean, it's very unusual for a player that young to take over the clubhouse, but he did. I mean, people look up to him, and I'm and look, I've been covering baseball long enough to remember what Keith Hernandez did for the Mets in the, in the late eighties and uh, the mid to the late eighties. I mean, players then look to Keith, uh, for inspiration. He's a type of leader that people just play better when he's around them. And judge has that same quality. There is something inspiring and f- affirming confidence building about his personality. And the Yankees are a better team or like, when he's in the lineup and we're well, certainly when he's in the clubhouse and in the dugout. And you can see last year when he was injured, he played 500 ball for almost seven weeks, in large part because Judge wasn't there. So I don't think it's any sort of premeditated campaign the Yankees built around Judge. It's who he is. He's one of those rare people who just inspires on his own. He's a leader, and it's a it's a natural born characteristic. Well, before we let you go, Bob, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one about the uh, previous manager, one about the current manager, based on some stories in the book here. 
Uh, Joe Girardi, uh, he skippered this team for 10 years, never suffered a losing season, even through some of some really down points where they had guys like Vernon Wills and Travis Hafner and Lyle Overbay in the lineup. He still managed to finish five over 500 every year. Uh, in the book, it kind of describes as a very tenuous uh, relationship between Cashman and Girardi, especially during the end there where they seem to butt heads a lot. Is there anything that could have happened in the 2017 season if they get over to hump in Houston? Is that enough? Is there anything that could have happened in that playoff run where Cashman would have changed his mind and kept Girardi on in 2018? That's a great question because, uh, you know, ownership now says had even had the Yankees gone to the World Series, Girardi's term in New York, his run in New York was over. Um, I think Cashman just realized the Yankees were going to get a lot younger and that Joe had was in the process of losing the clubhouse, you know, no matter what kind of hot streak they put together in October of that year, that it was just time for a new voice, a new message, a new leadership style. Look, after a number of years, in this case it was 10, every manager's message falls on deaf ears. I mean, the same way it was time for Joe Torre to go after 2007, he just got worn down and his style became too predictable and it just just didn't work anymore. And I felt the same way about Girardi. He was, he's a very, very disciplined and detailed or, or oriented manager who was the perfect replacement for Torrey in 2008 and that in about the first five years. But then the Yankees went into a lull in the mid, in the mid aughts, you know, and a couple of years where they didn't make the playoffs. And then finally in the last two or three years, Joe had, you know, the, his players were getting younger. He was getting older. The age gap was growing wider. And the players just did not respond to him anymore. And I think Cashman decided he needed a younger manager, somebody who was more relatable, somebody who understood the players, who was better in the clubhouse with his players. All these qualities that Joe just didn't have. He didn't need them at first because he was such a, such a different type of manager than Tory. But by 2015, 16, 17, he had to do a better job of relating. And he just didn't have it. He's not, the, he's not that kind of person. So Aaron Boone was the perfect answer. He, the, he was the, the pendulum swinging in the other way, in the other direction. Now, I want to say one thing. I was listening to Girardi last night on, on Fox when he was in the broadcast booth with the Mets and, the Rockies. Mets and Rockies. Yeah, he called a little bit of that and, last night. And I thought he was terrific. I mean, this is, I, I kept listening to him and how engaged and informed he was, how spontaneous. He was actually colorful and charismatic and not, af not afraid to voice his opinions. I'm thinking to myself, where has this Joe Girardi been? Where was this guy over the 10 years of the, as manager of the Yankees? Because if that person had been in the dugout, Girardi very well might still be managing because that's who he is, I think. That's his natural personality. He was funny. He was witty. He was quick. But something had happened to him, especially over the last five, six years, where he was really stiff and sour and, like I said, unrelatable. And he just grew distant. And I think at that point, Cashman realized, I can't have somebody like that in my clubhouse when my players are about to get much younger, when there's this new generation of Yankees coming. I need a manager who they, the players can actually talk to and who can listen to them and relate to them. And that's why Girardi had to go and Boone was next. Bob, uh, before we let you go, we have one last question here about current manager Aaron Boone. Um, all of us here are big fans of Aaron Boone. We, we ha we've been since day one. We know he's not perfect and he's had his mistakes, but he, this year he's really seemed to even turn it around even more. Um, but really, you could ask 100 people this question and you'd probably get 100 different answers. What is Aaron Boone's role as manager right now? Because you talk about in the book about how analytics have become such a huge factor. And, and from what you just said with Joe and losing touch with his clubhouse, most people think that Aaron Boone's here to be to be their friends and not so much to to make big executive decisions on the field what what is his role and and how how could how could he get better in, in on the field with his decisions well you have to understand i mean you're asking a question that is really addresses a much larger issue in baseball what does any manager do now i mean the era of managers playing a hunch, you know, on the, going on their gut, deciding when to hit and run or steal or what pitcher to bring in from the bullpen, that's gone. It has been replaced by analytics. There's no situation in a game that you're watching that hasn't already been run through some computer software program. 
and has not already been relayed to the manager. Like, well, here's the greatest pro- probability of success if you do X, Y, and Z, or if you bring in player X instead of Y. So in that sense, baseball, the, the manager's role in baseball has moved, has evolved from decision makers, from strategist to communicator. And that, that, re- and that requires a different type of person than, say, Billy Martin or Earl Weaver or Whitey Herzog. Those guys could never manage in today's game because it's no longer just about strategy. It's hardly about strategy. It's going on the Yes Network before and after every game or going on SNY before and every game. You have to be the face of the organization, literally. And you have to explain yourself. You have to be able to talk to the fans in an articulate way, in an honest way. Girardi was not good at at it at the end. I mean, he was sour and he was stiff and very often we caught him lying about it. Look at Mickey Calloway. He just seems overwhelmed in front of a camera and and, uh, he just seems to be out of touch with his players. Aaron Boone is really good uh, at at communicating, at telling viewers, fans, what's going on in the clubhouse. And he he has his finger on the pulse of the team. And I think that's the most important thing is that he can he is able to get the most out of these players. Is it 100%? No. But he's able to get this team pulling in the same direction the way that Alex Cora did last year with the Red Sox. I think that was a marvelous managing job because the players believed in Cora. They were all in behind that guy. And I think Boone is, is inching closer to that. I think the players really like Boone. It's a healthy clubhouse. There's nobody grumbling off the record. There's nobody backstabbing each other. You know, there, it's not an easy place to manage in New York. There's so much scrutiny. And you have some interesting guys, some difficult guys. Clint Fraser has to be handled differently than, say, Aaron Judge. Boone is good at that. And that's the role of the manager is basically basically being a therapist, a personal therapist for 25 different guys. Like I said, it's a different skill set than the managers I first covered early in my career, like the Davy Johnsons and the Billy Martins. I mean, that's just another time in baseball, which will never come back. It's funny you just brought that up because I just wanted to follow up with one last question. How does this affect your career covering this team and and for so many years? It's almost like you can't put blame of certain things on certain people because you just said the analytics speak for everything. Oh, it's a different job. I mean, there's no question what I was doing at the age of 25 is much different than what I'm doing now. It used to be, and it was more fun, I'll be honest with you, it was more fun covering the 80s Mets because the news came from the clubhouse. The players were the most interesting figures, you know, in the day-to-day coverage. I mean, my job was to have, was to have total access and the trust of Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden and Keith Hernandez, because they were important. They're the ones who people wanted to read about uh, quoting them and getting information from them is what made the difference between a good reporter and a bad reporter. One who has really had his finger on the pulse of the clubhouse today, the players are much less important. And the game is covered through the prism of analytics and and front office and player moves and scouts and and transactions. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's really all about roster construction now more than game stories and certainly more than covering the players and their personalities. It's really about what's the next trade, who's going to get fired, uh, and having a, a firm grasp of analytics. So it's a totally different job for me than it was back in the day. Well, Bob, we can't thank you enough for coming on and spending uh, part of your Sunday evening with us talking about the Yankees in your book, Inside the Empire. Uh, Next week is actually Father's Day. Inside the Empire would make a great gift for any baseball fan that uh, wants to read about how this current Yankee team and all the moving parts, uh, how it was constructed. Can you tell the fans uh, where they might be able to pick up a copy of Inside the Empire? Uh, you can find it anywhere where books are sold uh, and online at Barnes & Noble. But, I um, mean, here's a little tip. Amazon has has cut the price way under Barnes & Noble's price. So you get a great deal on Amazon.com. The book is right there. Bob, we can't thank you enough for uh, joining us for a few minutes here and giving us a little insight uh, behind really how you how you came up with the idea of this book and, and where your career has led. We, we thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. It was fun to talk about it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bob. How Take care. Going, Bob? Thank you. All right, we're back here, episode 125 of the NYYST podcast. That was our interview with Bob Clappish. You can follow Bob on Twitter at Bob Clapp, K-L-A-P. 
Uh, as he said there, with Father's Day coming up, you can uh, pick this book up on Amazon.com where uh, it has hit a significant price reduction compared to Barnes & Noble. And if you have Amazon Prime, it could probably be there next day. So you have plenty of time to order it and give it to your pops for Father's Day. You have Amazon Prime? Uh, you have yeah. everything else. Yes, I have Amazon Prime. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. I got it for free. Oh, you did? Yeah. Free shipping. <laughs> That's some pretty interesting stuff with the old Derek Jeter thing, huh? I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I brought up what I did because I don't know how I feel about Derek Jeter. Me neither. Like, it's a very weird feeling. And I try and just separate Jeter, the player that was here for so many years, to Jeter, you know, post-playing career. Because if you don't and you really just mix it all together, it's kind of difficult to to comprehend it's not difficult to comprehend yeah that's because okay. you're just so literal you okay because i'm gonna you just take okay. it for what it, okay. everything is i'm gonna take it for what it is he's not a yankee anymore so whatever right. he does doesn't matter per so that doesn't it doesn't bother you though the things that have come out no and does it tarnish his legacy as a baseball player that's well, that's why I'm saying I separate it because I could see where people... He's not a Yankee. If he was doing this as a executive of the Yankees, maybe you look at it a little bit differently. But because he's doing it in Miami with the Marlins, who cares? It doesn't... I'm not going to change the way I feel about Derek Jeter as a baseball player and what he meant in the memories and everything that he did on the field because he may have acted like a jerk to John Carl Stan. Who cares? He did it as a Miami Marlin and it actually benefited the Yankees. So good. Thank you. True. I I agree with you in that sense. That's why I'm saying I separate the two. But what I'm trying to say is he painted the perfect picture to everyone. So it's I'm sure it's difficult for some people to now read and hear that he's not that perfect. Uh, right. I think his image has definitely changed. Right. Since he's been the owner of the Marlins. Okay. Partial owner. Okay. Uh -huh. so, okay. So you could say that it changed, but did it really did it change? change? It didn't change. They're not taking his monument away. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. See that? I mean, people would want to, you know, people that never liked Jeter because he was a face of the Yankees during their glory run want to say, oh, see, Jeter, this and that, because now uh the way he's been portrayed as the owner of the marlins who cares it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it really doesn't it, it means absolutely nothing in terms of his career with the new york yankees nothing i agree i agree yeah i agree with that good way of putting it if anything you should read the book and see how closely uh maybe he came to not being a yankee in that uh, there's a story in there with his final contract negotiation where he was kind of insulted by some of the things that Brian Cashman was saying about him, but ultimately he didn't really want to go anywhere. You're talking about Jeter here, right? Yes. The whole Tulowitzki yeah. comment from Cashman. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Tulowit Brian Cashman finally got his wish to get Troy Tulowitzki in a Yankee uniform and uh, didn't exactly... It didn't, it didn't end up... Didn't really work out too right. well for him. Okay, so maybe this was just like uh, karma coming back at him for saying that uh, back in what 2011 or 12 when mm -hmm. Jeter negotiated his final contract. Right, he retired in 14. He, yeah, he was done in 14. So it was probably after the after the 2011 season that that all happened because he signed a three year deal. That was his final contract. So. So we uh, want to thank Bob Clappish for coming on here. Please uh, go pick up the book Inside the Empire. There's a lot of great stories in there. Like we said, how Girardi ultimately, uh, his, his fate was sealed uh, pretty much beyond anything that could have happened in 2017. His fate was already sealed. What makes Aaron Boone the perfect manager for this new era of baseball uh, how John Carl Stanton got here, even on some background on how Didi Gregorius got here. If you want to read how contentious things were between Cashman and Jeter, that's in the book. Plenty of great stories about really how this new uh, era of Yankee baseball has been formed because after the passing of George, it was passed down to Hal. We're going to forget the Hank era because that was one year and a disaster. And then we'll say it was passed down to Hal and how Hal kind of said, okay, Brian, you do your thing. Yeah. And like I've said multiple times on this show, this is really the first year. This is truly Brian Cashman's team. And we're really seeing what he's capable of. He's start. He had a clean slate after 2016. 
Um, so this is a big year for, for Brian Cashman's legacy, in my opinion. So as we said, go to, go to Amazon.com. Just type in Inside the Empire. If some weird Star Wars crap doesn't pop up, then uh, this book will. So order the book. Uh, get it in time for Father's Day. We want to thank Bob once again for joining us. Follow him on Twitter, at Bob Clapp. Follow our sponsors, Baseballism, on uh, Twitter, also at Baseballism. Follow us on Twitter, at NYY Sports Talk. Do you fellas have anything else you want to add before we uh, take it home? That's it. All right. Stack Guy Rye. Go. Chris. Say goodbye. Peace.